you will be treated to my voice this morning as we do the seven line prayer. We'll do it three times and then we'll go into the regular prayers. Susan. Yes. Sorry. We're now recording this meeting. Okay, we are now recording this meeting. So if you do not wish to be recorded, um, but you still want to stay present, you can turn on your mic or turn off your mic and turn off your video. Um, but your presence will still be recorded. Um, and if you do not wish to be recorded at all, um, thank you for joining and have a good day. You'll have to leave. Okay. You know, all right. teacher, for destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, for destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, for destroyer, thus gone, Fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, 
Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three, ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the ways of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. On my masters, my idams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Rana Mandalakam Nayatayami. the heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Dam. Thus did, I, thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom 
and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva and Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient and not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch and no phenomena. There is no eye element and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment and thus all no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point in nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, tayata, gate gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisoha, tayata, gate gate. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose in that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thank you, Susan. Anyway, um, thanks to the kindness and insight of, of Lama Jimpa, uh, he asked me to give a, a talk this morning about Hasidic tales, uh, probably because I kept bringing them up uh, in Darshan. And uh, 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 I'd like to sort of give a, a, a bit of background to this. Uh, in terms of 
personal background, <clears throat> pardon me, I spent five years uh, in my 20s uh, living and studying uh, with a Hasidic rabbi in Denver. And it was a, a rich experience. And although it left me with uh, uh, inner conflict for many years, how to reconcile my, my non-Hasidic or, or post-Hasidic life with the uh, authentic spirituality uh, that I found there. I didn't want to throw out the, uh, the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, the baby of authentic spirituality and, and heartfelt, um, um, heartfelt feeling with the bathwater of culture and place and time and uh, particularity. Um, for many years, I had, even before I, I became involved with uh, um, uh, the, uh, Lama Jimpa, I had a picture of the Dalai Lama uh, posted up on my wall, and there was a quote uh, accompanying the picture saying, um, there are many paths to a good heart. Um, although I've, I've taken uh, refuge, uh, uh, Hasidic Buddha Judaism was my path to a good heart. Um, and I think without that preparation, I might not have been um, as open to Buddhism as, as I later proved. Um, a little bit of historical background. Um, Hasidic Judaism is a sect that survives from the time roughly of the American Revolution. Um, it's notable for an emphasis on Kabbalah or Lurianic mysticism. Prior to the uh, Hasidic movement, this kind of mysticism was the um, the purview of only a, f a very small number of scholars, mostly people who lived in a, uh, a town in present day Israel called B'nai Barak, which is where the famous medieval Kabbalists uh, worked and wrote their, their uh, famous books, including the Zohar. Um, uh, Kabbalah, I, I, can't, I can't really uh, explain Kabbalah any more than I can explain, you know, easily explain the uh, uh, what, we're, what we're reading in, in uh, the Buddhism classics. But um, let's say that Kabbalah visualizes the world as being actively enlivened by the presence of God. Um, everything exists in Kabbalah because of the presence of God. Uh, everything uh, the most, the most um, um, inanimate things are covered with many layers of obscuration or, or um, uh, kalipot, uh, rocks, rocks and trees and so forth, where human beings have comparatively fewer obscurations uh, to the Almighty. Um, and a wise person who's learned in this mysticism can actually go up the rungs of this ladder and penetrate these various um, layers of obscuration to greater and greater holiness and connection with, um, with God. There is a, uh, a kind of a mysticism called chariot mysticism. Uh, you may, uh, Bersam Sholem might call it uh, Merhava mysticism, where uh, a person who's very elevated will essentially vacate their human personality and become entirely animated by an impersonal uh, holiness. Um, uh, I don't know if there's, I don't believe that there's actually a very good um, parallel in Buddhism, but it's an interesting thought. And this was, this was a very, very concrete act of belief in, in Hasidic Judaism. Well, Hasidic Judaism was also very much about treasuring every single Jew, however um, limited or impoverished or untalented uh, that Jewish person may be. Um, another major theme of Hasidic Judaism, as I hope we'll see in a few of the stories that I hope to tell, is that um, happiness uh, against all odds uh, is really, really important. The happy, happiness is not a thing that we passively experience from favorable external circumstances, but rather a thing, it's an action, it's a thing that we do, it's a, it's a decision we make. And this is clearly, uh, uh, we can clearly make this analogy 
uh, to uh, Tibetan Buddhism that uh, uh, despite despite all of our difficulties, um, we, we must remain happy. Otherwise, if we allow ourselves to slide into uh, depression, uh, especially at a time like this when we're feeling a lot of cultural and political and uh, stress and having a public health emergency, um, uh, it's easy to lose heart and it's easy to lose our happiness. Uh, but if we do so and we slide into depression, uh, um, we're lost, in my opinion, and we become our own enemy. Anyway, um, another parallel that I always find really interesting uh, between um, um, Buddhism, especially Zen, and also Indo-Tibetan Buddhism is the emphasis on anecdotes about famous people that, um, especially in the Zen tradition, um, a lot of the teaching consists of anecdotes about people. And this is a way of sort of humanizing or showing how people can um, um, actualize or realize mystical principles in their everyday life actions and, 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 and sayings. Um, and sometimes you find the same stories in, in Zen Buddhism and in Orthodox Judaism, which a number, of people have, a number of folks have written about already. One such story that my rabbi, um, uh, Rabbi Tversky of blessed memory, who, who um, lived and died in Denver, Colorado many years ago, he said, um, uh, people who are knowledgeable, People who know uh, don't talk. And people who talk don't know. They actually, um, word for word, I found that same anecdote in both traditions. Um, also in both traditions, there is an emphasis on the inner life and neglecting the world. <clears throat> in um, Hasidic Judaism, the inner life is called insides, your, your inner world, your panimiot. You're, where you really live is in your heart and, and your um, um, your spiritual circumstances. And sometimes, if, if even if you live in dire poverty, as many of the people who lived in um, Hasidic villages were very often living in um, uh, areas that were not nice physically, often, sometimes treeless prairies with um, um, marshy, uh, bad smells, uh, poverty. Uh, but they had a very, very rich uh, spiritual life and were often very happy. Uh, a, a story, not necessarily a traditional Hasidic story, talks about um, uh, the happy man. Uh, he's sitting at his Sabbath table where one would normally expect uh, a richly laid out meal, but he and his wife are, are very poor. And he asks for, uh, he asks for a, a, a beautiful slice of chicken and she hands him a piece of bread and goes, and he eats it, goes, oh, this is delicious. And he says, man, I want now, and he goes on, on and on like that. I, now I want this puree or this, uh, this pudding. And she keeps handing him pieces of bread and he keeps eating and goes, oh, it's delicious, it's delicious. And this sounds a lot like uh, Don Quixote, um, but um, um, I think that that's actually um, a good insight into the true inner spirit of Hasidut, of, of, of Hasidic Judaism. Here's a story that the rabbi would tell, and he often told these stories as rabbis traditionally do from their table. And you're, we're all seated around the table. It's a Sabbath or, or a Jewish holiday. And there's a festive mood. There's a lot of food. Um, um, and he'll tell a story about people, earlier generations in his dynastic uh, Hasidic family. He was sort of a, a scion of a, a famous uh, Jewish family. And he was talking about one of his uh, grandfathers or great grandfathers who was sitting around troubled one day. And he's like, his face was all full of, his face was dark. And uh, someone else, perhaps a, a, young, a young grandchild asks him like, grandfather, why, why, why are you upset? Why are you looking dark? And he goes, he goes in heaven, there's trouble. You know, there's trouble brewing for the Jewish people. Um, and I see it in heaven and it's, it's, it's terrible. And the child says to him, what business is it of yours what goes on in heaven? Your job is to be happy. And at that moment, the man said, you're correct. And his face changed immediately and he began beaming with happiness. It's a true story.
at least it was represented as a true story when the, when the rabbi told it. Um, I'm telling stories a little bit free associatively. I, I hope you don't mind. Um, Lama a few years ago talked about you know one's spiritual biography, and uh, the Dalai Lama has also talked about um, this in the same way. Dalai Lama has said, in effect, I'm not quite verbatim, unfortunately, that um, uh, we pay a lot of attention to the education of our children in terms of business and practicality and profession. We don't pay as much attention to the education of their heart. And that was one reason why um, I became attracted as a very young person uh, to this um, unworldly Hasidic movement. Uh, my parents, who are marvelous people, warm people, good people, um, were also very much um, uh, oriented to a scientific view, a purely scientific or mechanistic view of the world. Um, uh, and I think that there was there was something in me that was looking for um, a different kind of, of uh, a different kind of uh, view of life. When I met uh, Rabbi Tversky, I, I met someone who was unlike my parents all the time, very emotional, very warm, very available, uh, um, and a man who could um, cry easily when he was uh, leading the prayer service for the Day of Atonement the most solemn day in the Jewish calendar, uh, he, would, he would cry actual tears. Now, there are people who um, can evoke tears theatrically, and there are cantors who will make a tearful sound as an affectation when they're singing the beautiful um, synagogue melodies. But the rabbi was a person who actually felt this and actually was weeping real tears uh, for his sins on the Day of Atonement. Um, and to see someone like that, with that kind of um, commitment and uh, belief, was very, very striking to me. And I had to find out what made him tick. I had to find out what his secret was. Of course, I never, I never really found out. Um, I, I, I left uh, long before uh, I could ever fully um, plumb those depths. Maybe I, I couldn't. The, the rabbi was a, uh, a turbulent and troubled person, not a, not a perfect person. Um, he was, he had a spirit of rebellion. And I think that he had a deep inner conflict between um, being the scion of a very well-known family, the nephew of this one, the grandson of that one, you know, the uncle of that one, and also wanting to assert his own individuality and find his own path, his own spiritual path, because he had a powerful and authentic um, uh, spiritual personality. A, a story he told many times, pardon me. Someone, in, you know, uh, uh, again, someone probably in his family from many generations earlier, uh, whose father had died and the son, as tradition dictates, had taken over the uh, the pulpit in in, uh, in succeeding his father, but didn't do th the same didn't follow the same customs as his father, not the same usages. And the older people from the congregation came to him and they said, "You don't do like your father." That's an accusation. And he goes, "I do like my father. My father didn't follow anybody, and neither do I." That was sort of like sort of the rabbi's um, um, cri de cour, his, 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 his statement. Uh, that rabbi was really a fresh thinker. He was a, a profound psychologist and had great insight into people. And uh, he was very interested in people not being stuck in what they did well and never venturing, never, never taking the risk of trying something new which is obviously uh, important if we're going to grow uh, spiritually. Uh, he was against stagnation. He called it the rigor mortis of success. And he told a, a, a story, which I believe was his own invention, uh, about a man with a Coke machine. He goes to the Coke machine and he puts in a quarter back in the day. And, and he pushes the button for a Coke and it rumbles and a Coke comes out. He goes, this is remarkable. I, I found a winning formula. 
and it keeps putting it puts another quarter in and a coke comes out half an hour later somebody walks by and the man is surrounded by 30 or 40 bottles of coke and the guy says to him what the hell are you doing the man says why should i stop now i have a winning formula also the rabbi was against competition this is also an area that resonates well with buddha dharma that we really really discourage comparing ourselves to others because we're all coming from different angles and different places and different karmic backgrounds and it's totally inappropriate for us to to feel envious or compare ourselves with others however tempting this is and, and there's in, in a parallel that the rabbi felt very very strongly he felt that uh present day um uh, jewish seminarians young young men in uh, yeshiva who were learning talmud and religious law were being standardized intellectually and he felt that that was a unfortunate uh, an, an unfortunate thing um <clears throat> he said when there when there's winners and losers in a, in a classroom you have one winner and 20 losers and the winner is not even really a winner the rabbi would also tell stories like all hasidic leaders about the legendary founders of the uh, hasidic movement uh, the movement was founded by a, a kabbalistic master who was known by as in the hebrew words baal shem tov uh, Shem Tov is Hebrew for meaning the good name. The good name is actually a euphemism for the uh, four-letter name of God, the Tetragrammaton, so-called. Um, the fact that he was a master of the good name suggests that he was had the ability to pronounce the name of God in different ways to produce magical or powerful or sorcerer-like effects when necessary. Uh, the, the rabbi told a story about the Baal Shem Tov um, and his horses. Um, the story is actually a good analogy to uh, an idea in Buddhism that having a single uh, exciting experience or a single auspicious dream uh, is actually meaningful in the long run. It's not. Here's the story. The Baal Shem Tov had an urgent um, mission and he suited up his, he fitted up his four horses and a little carriage and uh, generally whipped his horses into uh, a, a fast gallop. And they were galloping. Normally when the Baal Shem would travel this same route, he would stop three times and let the horses water and eat some hay. But today was very urgent. Uh, he was, and we had, time was short and he didn't stop. So they drove past the first stopping place. The horses said to themselves, oh, we didn't stop. We must be very important horses. And then he drove on and drove on. And the second stopping place, they didn't stop. And the horses said, this is interesting. We're the most important horses in the world. And he drove them on and drove them on further and passed the third stopping place. And the horses said, we're no longer horses. We are angels. Finally, the Baal Shem arrived at his destination and threw down a load of hay for the horses to eat. And the horses ate the hay like horses. Uh, you know, one, one elevating experience does not uh, instantly produce a uh, change. Um, That's sort of relatable to Buddhism. Uh, with the... Um, uh, Here's another one. Like, I'm sorry, relatable to Buddhism in the, sense, in the sense that one interesting experience, however powerful, does not automatically make us into a mature uh, or enlightened personality. Here's another dream story. Um, uh, someone goes to a famous rabbi and goes, I had a rabbi, I had a dream. He goes, oh, yeah. I had a dream that I became a great tzaddik, I became a great scholar saint. With disciples all around me. What do you think? Is that is that auspicious? And the rabbi said, No, 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 no. When other people dream of you, start dreaming about you, that's auspicious. Let's make a transition from the Baal Shem Tov to his first and most influential disciple, 
this was a very, very legendary character, scholar, very powerful personality, very influential personality called the Magid, the Magid of Mezrich. Uh, we talk a lot about the Magid of Mezrich because all of the famous dy dy Hasidic dynasties evolved from him like uh, spokes of a wheel coming out of a hub. But uh, the 12 or 15 most famous, you know, the first famous founding fathers of the Hasidic movement were all direct disciples of the Magid. Uh, there's a, a, a belief in liberal Judaism that Hasidism is anti-intellectual and entirely uh, centered on emotion. This is uh, incorrect. Uh, Hasidism, especially in the um, among the scholar saints, uh, is very, very scholastic and very scholarly, uh, especially in their scholarship involving um, Zohar and um, uh, spiritual subjects. But it's at the same time, there was a great respect for authenticity and being heartfelt. And this is nowhere better illustrated than in the friendship between the Magid, who's this enormous personality, enormous intellect, and uh, a, a, a real rabbi named Reb Zusha. Reb Zusha was not the founder of a dynastic family. Reb Zusha was a simpleton. Uh, he, he could not really um, uh, understand uh, a lot of the um, abstract or complex reasonings behind Talmud or, or um, uh, Jewish mysticism. And yet he was so heartfelt that uh, he, he commanded a great deal of respect among the more educated people in his circle. The most famous story about Reb Zusha um, is that uh, there's a time he says, when I go and I'm before the last judgment and God asks me, you won't ask me, why weren't you as great as the Magid? Why weren't you as great as David and Solomon or Moses? He'll say, why weren't you Zusha? Why didn't you become yourself? That's, that's the most famous story about him. There's also a beautiful story. How am I doing with time? Uh, good about three minutes. Perfect. It's a very famous story um, uh, that shows the uh, friendship of the Magid and Zusha. And Zusha approaches the, the Magid one day and says, I want you to teach me this difficult, mystical doctrine called the Ten Principles of Devotion. And the Magid says, I can't teach you. I just... There's, there's no way. You don't have the background. But I can tell you about a thief and a child. A thief works in secret at night. The thief will risk his life to steal something of value, and the next morning he sells it for a fraction of its value. The thief loves his fellow thieves. He loves his um, um, profession, and he wouldn't do anything else for a living. A child is always busy. A child is always happy. And when a child wants something, he or she wants it so much, so wholeheartedly, they cry. I think the comments about the child are self-explanatory, but the comments on the thief, I think, are an, an, an analogy or an allegory about the Jewish scholar. Like, like, the, like the thief, the Jewish scholar or the Buddhist scholar does his or her work at night. They're, they're studying in, 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 in solitude. No one knows what they're doing. And they risk their life to steal something of value and then sell it the next day. This is about that our, just like Lama Jimpa, if, if I am allowed to uh, bring our teacher into this, has gone through a lot of intense life experiences to learn certain things and then give and then teaches them to us on a silver platter. We, we can we can gain the benefits of his learning, um, hard 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 earned, hard gotten learning, uh, without effort. So the 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 the, the, the Torah scholar works, she or he works very very hard. Uh, even travels long distances to learn certain things and then gives them away freely to uh, his or her students. 
Uh, and the Torah scholar loves the company of other scholars and wouldn't do anything else um, for a living. So it's an allegory. One of the most famous of the Hasidic rabbis, and one of the most interesting that you may have heard about was a, uh, a, a man from Bratislav, uh, Poland, Rabbi Nachman. He was called the Bratislaver, or Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav. Um, my own rabbi characterized Rabbi Nachman as an extreme personality. And it bears, it bears testimony to the extremity of, of Rabbi Nachman that we could actually credibly believe the legend about him that he quit Judaism or abandoned his village for a number of weeks and rode horses with the, with the Cossacks. Whether it's a true story or not, I don't know. But the fact is actually plausible is insight into the um, in incredible nature of, um, of uh, Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman outwardly seemed grandiose. He said, it's like every day of my life, I'm on a new spiritual level. There are also Buddhist parallels to this, where, where I, and I, forget, I'm, I apologize, I don't want to give a, a wrong attribution, but, but one of the earlier Tibetan writers said, the pupil with very high ability can learn something extraordinary every day, where the pupil of ordinary ability can only learn one extraordinary thing, perhaps once a month. Um, and again, what he sounded grandiose, he said, you know, the spiritual well-being, the survival of all the Jews in Poland depend on me personally. Um, at the same time, Rabbi Nachman was a wonderful explainer of mystical issues. And he primarily he used wonderful fairy stories or, or little 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 allegories of his own invention, which have been off reprinted, and you can and um, uh, or become sort of part of, for better lack of a better word, world spiritual literature. Um, um, I'm going to tell one of these stories right now, uh, where um, there was a, an astrologer in the village, and he looks to the, to the in the stars. And the astrologer says to the king, he says, the next wheat crop it will be poison. If you eat any of this wheat, poisoned wheat, you will go crazy. And the king says, well, we have storehouses full of healthy wheat. So at least the, the you know, you and I and the aristocracy can eat the healthy wheat and not go crazy while the rest of the populace goes crazy. And then he thinks about it and says, no, that's not going to work because if the rest of the populace is crazy and we're not, they won't understand us. There won't be communication. We're going to have to eat the poisoned wheat and become crazy. But what will we do? So uh, a wise man in the court said, this is what we'll do. Before we eat the poisoned wheat, we're going to put a mark on our foreheads to remind us, whenever we see this mark, we'll say, we know that we're crazy. And accordingly, they ate the poison wheat. And when they saw the, the mark on their foreheads, it reminded them, remember, you're deluded. In my interpretation, this is an allegory about um, uh, why Jews wear different kind of clothes, why they wear you know, long forelocks and skull caps and long black caftans in, in, the, ancient, in the old days, just because it's an outward reminder that I'm uh, living a spiritual life and I'm not. I have to remind myself at every moment that, 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 I, that I'm deluded. Uh, one second here. Again, going back to my personal background, when I left um, Hasidus, it was, a, it, was a, it was a conflict for me because um, um, there was authentic spirituality on one hand, uh, but I really did not find myself able to fully enter that world. There are friends of mine who could, could actually sort of turn their back on all of Western culture and and go to Israel and live a very poor life, um, eating you know potatoes and, and onions and and study 
and study Hasidut. And I was, it was a bridge too far for me. I couldn't do it. And I reproached myself for many years for not having the strength of faith or the strength of character to make the full, uh, make the full journey. But for, for better or for worse, I was not able to do it. Um, and I believe that there are lessons we can bring from Kabbalah, but at the same time, Kabbalah is not a thing we can put into the Cuisinart of New Age spirituality. You know, you know, when you put things in the Cuisinart, everything comes out tasting like cucumber and mango, right? And it's not, it's not, it's not this or it's not that. Um, and and I, I prefer that the, the Hasidim and Hasidut live behind its own firewall, so to speak, and not to dilute it with my um, uh, new age preconceptions and whatnot. But there are a few things after many years of struggle. Um, I saw the rabbi in my dreams for, for 30 years until I actually had to ask him to, to go away. But what can I take with me? Well, um, heart. The, the belief, the, 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 the wholeheartedness, the intensity of a belief, the idea that this was your spirituality is an overriding importance and, and guides all of your or our movements during the day. The idea of, of happiness is, is common to both Hasidut and, and, and Buddha Dharma. That even though we're <clears throat> in a terrible crisis right now, um, um, politically, culturally, um, an era of uh, public health uh, uh, crisis, and it'd be very easy to get frightened or cynical or too angry uh, and lose our joy. And again, if we do that, then we're lost. We've become our own enemy. Um, if you are interested in um, learning more about Hasidut, there are a number of books. Um, um, this, this does not show very well on, on camera, I don't believe. Uh, this book, a little hard to find. The author's name is Langer, L-A-N-G-E-R, the book is called Nine Gates, Nine Gates of the Hasidic Mysteries. It's about a, um, a t early 20th century um, uh, Czechoslovakian man who journeyed to the uh, Hasidic outposts uh, where no civilization, Western civilization existed. These places were mostly destroyed um, in the First World War, they became battlefields. And in the Second World War, they came for the people. Uh, I don't have to tell you what happened after that. Um, also, Martin Buber, uh, Longer, L-A-N-G-E-R, first name is Yiri, J-I-R-I. This is a delightful book. This is just, if you want, it's a wonderful book. I recommend it um, on, on, on every criterion. Uh, there are two anthologies of Hasidic stories. I think the best ones I know are from the philosopher Martin Buber, B-U-B-E-R. You know Martin Buber, I and thou. Um, one volume for the early, early masters, a second volume, later masters, uh, printed by Schocken. There's also a separate volume devoted to the stories of Rabbi Nachman, which are delightful, um, also in, under the Schocken imprint. And uh, there's a man named Lewis Newman, no relationship, uh, who did a wonderful nice thick book, uh, a Hasidic anthology. So these were also sources for me. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking. Thank you very much. I hope this made some sense to you. It really is very, very meaningful and helpful for me to be able to share this with you, with, uh, with my Sangha, um, things I haven't, I haven't shared before. So I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go offline. Am, am I on? Am, are there questions? Please, please ask something or, or bring your own stories or, or say that I'm making no sense, but please, please say something. I'll leave it on. Hey, Morris, this is Susan. So yes. is there a, um, 
a meditative, a contemplative. It sounds like there's very much a contemplative and, and a, a um, scholarly aspect to this, but is there a meditative? Um, I mean, you see pictures uh, of, of the Hasidic Jews, you know, at the Whaling Wall, right? And doing a lot, a lot of praying. Um, but is there also meditation or is it, is there a solitude or is it in community? There actually, there actually is um, a formal technique of meditation called Hit Bananut. Um, the late uh, illustrious Jewish scholar Arye Kaplan wrote a book about this. Even though you see most, most Jews uh, dot praying, uh, bobbing back and forth, called davening. And very often, um, in my belief, they will achieve some level of meditative um, stability. Uh, but there actually is a formal technique of meditation um, that Hasidim um, have learned. How, how widely or universally used, I can't, I can't say. Did you learn to meditate through this? No. No, although I had friends who had, re you know, actually read the books and learned how to meditate. Um, but standing up, standing very straight and swaying slightly, it's, I think it may have analogies to standing meditation. Another, another comment. Everyone's asleep this morning. Okay, I'm going to jump in again. Um, you mentioned uh, a, a rabbi who, um, I don't remember the word you used, but he said that every day his realizations and powers became more and more. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and that, 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 that was like audacious. Yeah. And um, there's actually a, uh, I think, a parallel in... Buddhism, when, when you're doing um, the four immeasurables, you know, you're saying yeah. may, may all sentient beings be happy. And then, you know, I myself, and you end that particular piece with I myself will cause them to be happy. So there's kind of a grandiosity in that as well, but it's, it's aspirational. Yeah. As opposed to like, you know, real. So maybe it's aspirational. Well, again, there's another parallel. If I can, if I can, thank you for mentioning that. There's a parallel of, of the three levels of of uh, religious follower in Buddha Dharma. There, there is um, um, the, the low uh, the low capacity person, uh, the person of middle capacity, and and, and the high the high um, the high capacity person. Right? We all know this. There's also a parallel to this in Judaism. In Judaism, the low capacity person is whether, there's a question whether she or he will actually um, become, let's say, spiritually successful. They'll get to the other side, so to speak. They'll become a, a solid, successful, well-rooted well spiritual personality. Will they, you know, yes, or will they succeed or not succeed? The low, the low, the low person. The middle person is, they will succeed, but how far will they grow? How far will they go? Will they just be a, be a, a minimal, you know, uh, re be reborn in the upper worlds, so to speak, or will they actually grow and go much farther? And for, for the high capacity person, there's no question that they're going, they're going to succeed. The only question in their case is how many people will they bring with them? How many people will they raise up out of ignorance and bring with them to a, a spiritual rootedness. So thank you for reminding me of that. Are we, are, everyone else is in, is, is in complete concord. Uh, I really enjoyed your uh, beginning, the cheerfulness. I had, a, I had a mentor who was sort of more like a second father to me who uh, had completed, he, he could have been a Roshi, but he didn't want to be. But my relationship with him had nothing to do with Zen Buddhism at all. Um, in fact, I, we 
hardly ever talked about anything having to do with Buddhism. Um, but he used to say to me, you don't have to be happy, but you do need to be cheerful. Just be cheerful and you'll be okay. <laughs> and he would also often say, just choose one thing and give your heart to it. Hmm. Instead of, oh, because I, I was known as uh, as my other uh, mentor who was a Martin big Martin Buber fan and used to take me down to the Lower East Side of New York and speak uh, Yiddish with the shopkeepers down there. He used to say, "You're like a pony tied to a stake, equidistant from fifty bales of hay. You just can't decide which one to eat." So that was the, uh, Ouch. How how oh, that's how I was. I mean, you know, I was like. Every, the whole world was available. I could decide it was. Uh, and you it, sit on the fence and you lose the benefit of both worlds. Yeah, it's the paralysis of choice. Too much choice. Yeah, paralysis it's of a choice. well studied uh, phenomenon, actually. But thank, uh, you. thank you. I, and Kabbalah was something that I became very interested in. But in a way, that was like uh, trying to read Nagarjuna and Nasanga without. A teacher, and I'm I'm reading this stuff, and it, it seemed it really it's interesting. Exactly to right. me. It is, it, it's exactly right. That that another obvious parallel between Buddha Dharma and and Hasidut um, is that it is an oral tradition, and there is you must be taught directly by a knowledgeable person. That the the uh, Rabbi Nachman is, although he has followers to this day. They never appointed a successor rabbi. They're the only Hasidim, except for the Lubavitch now, who don't who don't have a successor rabbi. Another story. But the but for many centuries, um, the followers of Rabbi Nachman had no successor rabbi to teach them. They just tried to rely entirely upon the written con written accounts of Rabbi Nachman. And my rabbi, Rabbi Tversky. Uh, disapproved. He said, you cannot learn Hasidism from a book. Like with 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 almost with with anger and contempt. Although he revered Rabbi Nachman. Anyway, is that is that all? Thank you for joining me and thank you for for giving me a, a, the space to uh, share this with you. Omahom. Omahom. Thank you, Morris. That was great. Thank you, Morris. Thank you, Morris. This is Sue. It was very interesting, and it was wonderful to hear your voice. Thank you again. I'd just like to say that I could listen to you all day, Morris. I just loved your talk so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. James, do you have a last comment? Yeah, I was just going to say it's it's just a pleasure to hear about your journey and what was motivating you and what was drawing you in in different places and just your authenticity with that it's just very heartfelt because we are on a hard path and um, it's good to remind ourselves of the obstacles on the path and sometimes the obstacles feel difficult at some time and they feel like we're maybe not doing what we're supposed to, but there's something that it's leading us to anyhow. And I think it's really nice to just hear of other people's journeys and, and how they go and how they hold those journeys. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, I feel closer to you. Thank you, thank you. I, ho I, hope, I hope you do. Okay. And I, oh. and I to you for having, for having you being willing to, to listen to me, put up with this jabber. We have the closing prayers now. And you have closing prayers, yeah. Well, that was delightful. So let's dedicate all of that practice and all of that delightful stories that that we just were able to to listen to. Thank you, Morris. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. 
In the land encircled by snow mountains, you were the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Resig, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. And may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losong, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manzushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangdrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. The verses that save Sakya from sickness, a prayer for the pacifying, the fear of disease. May all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harms of spirits, illness and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases, which like a butcher leaving an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases, the mere names of which can inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease and so forth, never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever sufferings arise due to disturbances in the four elements, depriving the body and mind of every pleasure, be totally pacified, and may the body and mind have radiance and power and be endowed with long life, good health, and well-being. <clears throat> By the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the power of the dakinis, dharma protectors and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results. May these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Thanks, Morris. Thank you, All right. Susan, Sorry, guys. Everybody else. I had to uh, bump Morris to be able to talk to you for a second. <laughs> this is the sound system. Um, so sort of building on one of the, the allegories that Morris gave us, uh, we do have um, teachings that are given wonderfully to us uh, and mostly freely given, but we do have bills to pay. And uh, it is really important that um, us as Sangha and students help uh, make that happen. Um, so your generous donations are always wonderful. Recurring donations of any amount are always wonderful. Uh, if you go to the website, you can click on the donate page and help support us in being able to provide a space for uh, Lama to give us these teachings, for students to help support these teachings, um, and for all of us to learn together. So if you could do that, that would be great. Um, any amount, again, is helpful. Recurring uh, uh, donations are really helpful. We are starting to um, put together the sound system and AV system in a very different way uh, so that once we get back in, um, at, into the temple, we'll have a better system that'll work easier for everyone. Um, you know, to give you a little heads up, I did post a picture on my Facebook page of what the system looks like. And if you look really close, you don't actually have to look that close. The camera is sitting on a piece of Tupperware. It's not going to work long term. <laughs> so, you know, there's some fundraising that we're going to start doing for that. So, um, you know, just keep us in mind in your uh, holiday giving. Um, some letters will hopefully go out in the next few weeks. But, uh, you know, we're a great place and everyone's appreciated and all of our support is needed, um, especially now.
So thank you. Uh, and I hope to see some of you on Thursday during Sangha chat. So in case you don't have anything else to do, come hang out with me online. Because I have nothing else to do. <laughs> uh -huh. But thanks. OK. Thank you. Are you providing food? food? Uh, um, <laughs> sure. Yes. I will provide food. I will have pictures of food. <laughs> It will look delicious. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be very similar to the story about the bread. Yeah. I think it'll be um, a little worse than the story about the bread. <laughs> but you can imagine it's bread. <laughs> Just don't eat your computer. <laughs> All right. I'm going to take off. Thanks, you guys. Good to see you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hasta luego. Thank you.